Hi, Michael Yardney here, and welcome to the second of two special podcasts I'm conducting in the series How to Profit from Renovations and Property Development in Our Changing Property Market. This isn't my normal weekly Michael Yardney podcast. It's a special bonus because this is something that's been requested by a lot of our listeners when I asked you to give me some content ideas for my regular podcast. So today I'm going to chat a bit about property development with property development expert Bryce Yardney. We're going to talk a bit about how to get started in property development. And this audio is for you if you're already a property investor but wondering how you can make profits in the current market. It's particularly for you if you want to move up to the next level in property investments and considering getting involved in property renovations or development. And especially if you're an advanced investor and you're wanting to manufacture capital growth. What we're going to talk about today is how some property investors end up getting both good cash flow and great capital growth by buying the right type of property and then manufacturing capital growth, cash flow and depreciation allowances through property development. And we're also going to discuss some of the traps you need to watch out for. And I'd love to have a chat about that with Bryce, the opportunities you can take advantage of. Now, we've only got about 35 minutes in this podcast, so we're going to give you a lot of information. But for those of you who feel you're going to want to take it further, don't worry. By the end of the session, we're going to show you how you can find out more. So, look, after that really long introduction, hi, Bryce. Hi. Now, Bryce, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. My background's in project management. I did a four-year project management degree about 10 years ago. Then I came into the real world and, and started working in development and found out that it was all theoretical, didn't count for too much. Worked for about three years in project management from town planning through to pre-construction through to construction. Then I started working in the beginning part of development as well, which is the due diligence, the feasibility of the project and then buying the development sites as well. Uh, for a little while I was, I was doing it all and then I started managing the, the department here at Metropole as well and managing a team and together we manage roughly 50 something projects for our clients at the moment. So you're involved in 50 medium density developments currently and over the years and lot more and lot. And you're, you're actually doing one yourself, Bryce. Yeah, I just bought my first development sites last year and we're about halfway through at the moment. Fantastic. Okay, so why would you listen to us when there are so many people currently today talking about property development? Well, Bryce isn't just theoretical, as I, as he's already explained to you. His team has, in the years he's been with us, gone through 250 or so developments successfully. But I got involved in development in the 1980s and I made lots of mistakes. A property boom carried me through then. I built some houses, apartments, townhouses, factories, in fact, two office buildings. I even did two broadacre subdivisions. And in about 2000, I set up Metropole Projects with my wife, Pam, and my business partner for many years, Gavin Taylor, who was an architect. And over the years, we got involved in some very substantial developments for clients and for ourselves. I'm currently involved in four developments myself. So you're not actually just hearing from theorists or somebody who last year was talking about how to do cash flow positive properties and this year teaching you how to do a development. We've done it ourselves and kept our uh, wealth over a number of property cycles. But the main reason I'm doing this special podcast series is because there's an increased request from people wanting to know how to become property developers and at the same time there are some new educators out there teaching people how to do it. And in my mind, there's lots of misinformation in the market. So my aim today is to discuss how to get involved in property development and more importantly, some of the risks that developers take. Because if you don't understand the risks that are involved with the rewards in this stage of the cycle where the market isn't going to be as favourable, you could get caught out. So let's start off with a question, Bryce. What actually is property development? I think what we'll discuss today is the broader context of pro of property development. So let's look at some of the options we have for people who are interested in getting involved in, in a development of some kind. The first and, and probably smallest and easiest one is you could look at doing a renovation or even a refurbishment to add value to a property, whether it's a house, an apartment. And renovations are where many of today's large property developers, including myself, got started. Well, same with me. I did a number of renovations for a number of years. It's a good place to start. 
The next option is you could land bank. And that term land bank came from larger property developers who bought large tracts of raw, undeveloped land, sometimes called greenfield sites as well, and kept their own bank of land for future development. We're talking about it on a much smaller scale for people like you and I who could buy a house, an older house close to land value that will be right for development soon uh, with the idea of developing it sometime in the future, whether that's in the next couple of years or four or five years down the track. It'll be there when we have the ability or, or we want to develop it. Interestingly, while a lot of big developers went broke doing land banking because they didn't have income, the concept of buying the worst house in a good street and just seeing it go up in value um, is a great investment concept that I've used personally for many, many years and a lot of other developers have also because it's the land component that goes up. So even if you don't start the development on day one, you're already making money straight away, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Because... I mean, the building and the house is the bit that depreciates, it loses value. The, the house is, the land is what does the heavy lifting and the big increase in, in the value. So it's there when the, you have the funding, you have the ability, the market conditions are right, you can uh, move on to the next stage of the development. The other option you could look at is to buy a block to develop and get started straight away on the development approval, which is what you will need from the council in order to build what you want to build, uh, whether that's units, townhouses, apartments. The other option you could do is you could buy a piece of land now with the idea of getting started on the development straight away and, and getting the development approval, which is what you will need from council to build what you want to build, whether that's units or townhouses or apartments. Once you've got that development approval, you've really got two options from there, which is you could sell it with that development approval, which will add significant value to the property for someone because you're taking the risk out of it for them. You're taking some time out of the development for it for them as well. Or you could proceed with the development yourself and make the development profit yourself. Then... While we're talking about sites with development approval, the other option is you can buy one from someone else who has got the development approval, which, like when you're selling it, takes the risk of getting the development approval and the time of, of getting the development approval, which can be 12, 18 months in, in some cases as well. So we're talking about a significant amount of time. So you can buy land with development approval in place and proceed with the building almost straight away. Or the last option, which most of our clients will do is become armchair developers, employer project manager to take care of the development from start to completion for you. Let's discuss some of the benefits of getting involved in property development uh, because I know some people have heard developers make lots of money, but I know a lot of people have heard that developers go broke. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole list of benefits to being a property developer. The big one at the very start is you're not going to be paying someone else their development margin. Someone else has had to go through all the trouble of doing it. They're going to want probably 15%, 15 to 20%, sorry, on their cost. Uh, So you're really saving that margin uh, by doing it yourself and making that margin yourself, as well as other little things along the way, like agent commissions, GST, marketing costs, which really add up and, and take a good chunk out of your profits. At the right time of the property cycle, you can make good profits selling your developments, and that's what most people will do. But the really smart ones don't sell their projects. They refinance them against their new higher value at the end of the development, take out their equity, and then they use that equity that they've manufactured by developing the property and use it as seed capital for their next project. Another benefit is easier finance. For development. Once you've completed your development, you can approach the lenders to refinance your property. Uh, they'll usually lend you 80% or potentially more of their retail value, not the, the cost of your development, but their retail value of what they are worth at the end. And in many instances, this is about what it would cost you to develop your project. Because we're saying if you're going to make roughly 20% on your development, then 80% of what they're worth at the end <coughs> is probably roughly your cost that you put into it. So um, let's be clear, you actually need a lot of money to get into the project, but once you're through it, 
it's a really great way to refinance, even in today's more difficult climate, because you've actually got pretty good cash flow, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. The cash flow at the end, remember, your yield will be based on your actual cost. If you go and buy the house down the street, the yield is based off whatever you pay for it. When you're developing it yourself, let's say your property is worth a million dollars at the end, you've only paid $800,000 to make that million dollar property. So you have a fantastic return on your own money uh, that will help with the cash flow. The other big uh, help when it comes to cash flow is gonna be the tax benefits of holding the development, the biggest of which is depreciation, especially in the first few years after building a new property, you're gonna have fantastic depreciation allowances that give you, uh, or reduce your holding costs to probably a lot lower than what you would think. But what about all these new rules about depreciation price? Does it affect new developments? It won't affect new developments. It's only going to affect existing properties and second-hand owners. Uh, if you're building it, developing it yourself and holding on to it, you will still be able to take advantage of the full depreciation allowances that we've been able to take, take into account for the last 20, 30 years. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the benefits of property development. You're going to save money. You could potentially make profits once you get through the project, easier financing. You can take advantage of the leverage by borrowing uh, against the costs, great tax benefits, higher rental returns. And if you do it right, what you're going to end up with is a high-growth property with um, good cash flow. So you've actually got the best of both worlds, Bryce. So, Bryce... You've dealt with lots of clients and you've dealt with uh, lots of developers, builders. What do you think makes a good property developer? The way I like to think of a good property developer is like a good movie producer. Someone who finds something and sees a vision when other people don't see it. And it's their job not to be involved in the day-to-day -day and the detail and drawing the lines. It's their job to coordinate a team of people, a team of experts, to make their vision come to reality. And you do need that combination as well of being able to see the big picture and coordinate that big picture. But also, you need to have an eye for detail, not because you're going to be there drawing the lines and... and uh, actively involved in that detail, but you need to be able to look at an architectural drawing and say, no, that's that's not right. You can't actually build that. It sounds great in theory, but you can't do it. Or to look at an engineering drawing and say, hey, he's put $10,000 extra steel in there that doesn't need to be there. So you need to have that eye for detail to keep everybody else in line. Okay, I bet some of our listeners now, Bryce, are thinking, okay, I like the idea, but how much is it going to cost? How much money do I need to get involved in property development? Depends which kind of development we're talking about. If we're going to start with renovations, uh, you could borrow uh, the equity you, you potentially already have in an apartment, in a house, and spend, say, $45,000 to increase the value on that property by say sixty to seventy thousand dollars plus you'll get an increase in rent and depreciation at the end of it if we're talking about land banking it depends which city we're talking about if we're talking about brisbane probably in the order of nine hundred thousand or so if we're talking in melbourne perhaps at least a million dollars to get into a good development site in melbourne and if we're talking about development you're going to need deeper pockets still so what sort of returns can you expect if you're going to get involved in property development, Bryce? We're talking about renovations. It's going to be a smaller return than a development because it's less money in, less risky, uh, less time as well. Uh, so we're talking you may get $1.40, $1.50 back for every dollar you put in to that renovation. So it's going to be relative to what you spend. Renovations do have a much lower ceiling on the profit you can potentially make because there's less value to be added than a development. If we're talking about a development though, you would want to see a margin on your development costs of at least 15% uh, on the longer time frames. Okay, 15% on the development cost, but in fact, it's often 80 or so percent return on, on your funds. So in my mind, getting involved in property development is a great way to manufacture growth, to create equity, but it's actually not a good way of making income. It's not a way to make a living. I know people are going to tell you, come to my weekend course and uh, you're suddenly going to be able to go home and give up your day job. Maybe in a booming market, the booming market carried everything. 
But for the current stage of the property cycle, if you're interested in getting involved in property development, it's something to do on the side and develop good long-term investment grade properties to keep, but to buy, trade and sell and pay tax, pay GST, there's all these other things people aren't aware of, stamp duty for the next one. In my mind, it's not a good way of getting involved in, or not a good reason to get involved in property development. Now, every October for two days, we sit with a group of experienced property renovators and developers at my property development renovation workshop that we're holding in October this year, again, where we go through all this in much, much more detail. So this is just a little taste of what's coming on there. And that's where we often change the headspace of people who come along they want to become developers and we show them how, but we actually show them the things that other people don't tell them because it's that old story of you don't know what you don't know and the concept of people thinking they can give up their jobs and become a developer gets them into financial trouble. But let's start with the beginning and we can work our way up. Bryce, why should you get involved in renovations? You should get involved. It's a good place to start. It's where I started. It's where you started. It's a good way to understand the process and a good way of maximizing your returns on your existing properties as well. If you already own something that has that potential to add value to it, to increase the rent, to create some depreciation benefits and manufacture some some growth, some profit in it, great way to get started. So, Bryce, if you're looking for a property with renovation potential, what do you look for? It's a good question because what you see a lot is beginners that overcapitalize. They want to create something beautiful. They want to make it a piece of art. They want to make it something they want to live in, which isn't the right way to approach it. Now, let's start with the big picture and narrow it down. When it comes to the location, it's the same criteria for buy and hold investments. You're looking for an area that's going to outperform the average. You've got to start with the end in mind. Uh, you've got to see what other comparable renovated properties sell for, and then you work backwards. So that's your end value, what other properties are selling for. Then you take away the cost of the renovation, your holding costs, because you're not getting any rent while all the renovations are happening either. You've got to have a profit margin in there, and then you've got to buy sufficiently well so that you've got that profit margin left in there for you at the end. You've got to have a plan, you've got to have a budget, and Somewhere in there, you've got to allow for a contingency as well because it's not going to go 100% to plan. There's always going to be little things in there that you don't expect. So have a contingency in there to cover that. You've got to be able to see opportunities where others see obstacles. If other people look at it and say that it's too hard, but you look at it and say that it can be done, then you're doing something that other people won't or aren't willing to do. So there's added opportunity in there for people that see it that way. We also look for properties that don't need structural work. That's where a lot of the money goes into structural work, changing walls and doors and uh, engineering and building permits. We like to stick to properties that you can add significant values to through cosmetic renovations. And the number one thing as well is surround yourself with a good team. It doesn't matter how good you are, you're not the one actually doing the day-to-day, you've got to have good people around you. And clearly, it's not as difficult to get finance for a renovation as it is for a development. Now, in the first part of this series of special podcasts, I went into much, much more detail about the renovation process and what comes first and what comes next and which trades you use. So if you haven't listened to it, go back to iTunes and you can actually get, or if you listen on an Android on Stitcher, and get the Michael Yardney podcast, and these special bonus episodes will be there. But Bryce, let's move on to development. What are the various stages involved in getting involved in a property development? All right. You could talk for an hour about the stages of property development, but we'll talk about it very briefly. The first thing, like any other property investment, is identifying the opportunity. Once you've done that, then you need to come up with an idea. What are you going to do with that opportunity? And then refine it, fine-tune it, make sure it's the highest and best use of that site. And then you test the feasibility as well. You run the numbers. You make sure that, uh, first of all, feasibility is only as good as the numbers you put into it. So you've got to be really confident in those numbers you're putting in there and allow sufficient margin in there for risk. 
Once you've identified the opportunity, you've looked at the numbers, you're confident that it works, then you need to start negotiating on, on the property. It might be an auction. You might be going uh, setting a budget going into that auction. Then you put a formal commitment, whether that's buying the property privately, off market, at auction, whatever it is, you secure the property. Then once you've secured it, you need to start working on the town planning stage of the development. You need to get the surveys and the arborists and you need to get the architects involved, start drawing the lines, start doing some concept plans and eventually they'll evolve into some town planning drawings. Then you have to go through the council process. You deal with council, you deal with neighbours, probably dealing with a little bit of politics as well. Once you've secured that development approval, then you need to do all of your construction documentation, go back to the architect, get the detailed architectural drawings, the engineering drawings. The biggest and probably most important one is the specifications as well. What kind of bricks are you going to use? What kind of paint colours? What kind of appliances? It's the difference between a good development and a great development, knowing what to put into those specifications. Then other little things like landscape plans and energy reports and subdivision. Then once you've got all that, you find your builder, you tender tender it out, perhaps you're going one-on-one -on -one with a builder, put your contracts together, get the site ready for construction. You've got to abolish all the services. You've got to demolish the old house, get started on the construction. Then when you complete your project, it's then about managing that, getting some good property managers in, getting the best rent, and managing your asset from then on. Well, gee, that's a long, long process. Now, a lot of people actually see the construction process and they think, ah, that's development. Interestingly, as we both understand, Bryce, over that two-year period, probably 80% of the work happens before you, and you make a profit, I guess, before you even get on site, don't you? Absolutely. And the most time-consuming bits are not the construction. It's dealing with council, dealing with neighbours, all the politics that come into development. So if you look at an apartment block going up across the street, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. Chances are two-thirds of the project came before you even saw it start on site. Now, we've only skimmed through that. Clearly, there's a lot more involved. Actually, people have often asked me, Michael, why don't you write a book on property development? Why don't you actually write a book that explains all this? And interestingly, I have. But I've actually never sold it. The only way to get it, my A to Z manual of property development, is at my two-day property renovations and development workshop that we hold in October. Hey, by the way, if you're interested in finding out more about it, go to realestateworkshop.com.au, realestateworkshop.com.au, and you'll see the team of the faculty I've put together to help teach you how to become a property renovator and property developer. Now, we don't teach you how to use a buzzsaw or how to lay one brick upon another. It's nothing like that. What we teach you is the business of property development, the tax elements, in particular finance, which is very difficult as, as well. And so you will get my property development manual with all our own internal checklists. Go to realestateworkshop.com.au and find out a bit more about my property development workshop. And if you come along, you're going to have my personal guarantee that you're going to learn the information you want. And you'll also, if you get one of the early bird spots, have a one-on-one -on -one implementation session with me afterwards. So as we started to say, it's a, it takes a long, long time to do a property development. Bryce, what do you look for when you're looking for a property with development potential? Sure. There's very diff it's very different to a property that makes a good investment property. Property, sorry. And firstly, while people live everywhere, not all properties make good investments and not all properties are investment grade properties. Then there's even fewer that make good development sites. And you can't trust what agents say when they advertise a property that says this development potential subject to council approval. I like to think of subject to council approval as it's like the word but. Nothing that comes before the word but means anything. Subject to council approval is the same thing. Boy, have we seen people come into our office who made mistakes. They bought a bargain on the weekend thinking they bought a, a site that had a potential for three units, but when the council of zoning only allows two, that bargain or perceived bargain they got no longer is. So, Bryce, let's go into a bit more detail. What do you look for? 
When we're looking for a good development site, you start with the physical aspects. It's got to be the right size, the right shape, the right dimensions. You've got to be in the right zoning to allow the kind of development you want to do and, and not allow the kind of development you don't want to be near as, as well. You've got to have the right access to services. You've got to be looking at setback requirements, open space requirements, parking requirements. And you've also got to understand the legal terms, the easements, the covenants, the overlays, what you can build on what which you can't. Then you've got to be able to do a little sketch or at least have, if you're an experienced developer, you could probably do it in your head as well. If you're not, you probably want to sketch it down. You need to have an understanding of town planning as well to be able to make sure that that sketch is something that's doable and it actually can be a reality. Now, one of the mistakes I see a lot of people make is say, oh, look, there's a two townhouse or duplex development down the road. I may actually actually do the same. The thing is the rules have changed, the planning regulations have changed, and just because somebody's done it before, they may well have got the development approval two or three years ago, and you couldn't get it again today. In Brisbane in particular, I know in the same streets, on one side of the street compared to the other, you've got heritage overlays or one end of the street compared to others. So just because you can develop in one area, you can't in another. So there's clearly some easy ways to tell, but there's also some complicated things. For I know, for example, Bryce, that uh, some councils have these under-the-counter policies that you don't even know about. Yeah, absolutely. And they're usually enforced through... There's two kinds of council policies. There's objective ones like you've got to have an eight-metre street setback, you've got to have a two-metre side setback. Then there's the ones that are subjective like neighbourhood character or visual bulk. What does that mean? It, it really is up to the person assessing it and that's how councils enforce these under-the-counter policies uh, through those subjective statewide policies to really get their way and yeah. neighbourhood character can be whatever they want neighbourhood character to be. Okay, so we talked a bit about having to get a team around you. Bryce, the big picture team will help manage your risks and you're going to leverage off their knowledge. So who would you suggest is in the team of particularly a beginning property developer? I think you're going to need a combination of detail and big picture people as well will help you manage your risks and that you can leverage off their knowledge. Starting from the beginning, you're going to need a good accountant, a good solicitor, and a good finance strategist as well. Someone that understands development, understands the cash flow requirements of development. You're going to need a good design team, architects, engineers. You're going to need a good town planner because if you can't get it through council, you can't get development approval, then it, you can't build it. Simple as that. Good land surveyor, quantity surveyors are needed for some, probably larger scale projects. Good engineer, arborist, traffic consultant, perhaps, if you, if you need one. Uh, and a really good development project manager is the most important one. That's who ties it all together, who manages all these other people for you, keeps your project on time, on budget and really build you something that is going to be worth building. Well, clearly a good team is going to save you money and reduce your risk. It's an investment, not an expense. But Bryce, we've made it sound too easy so far. There must be a catch. And look, I know there is. Over the years, I've seen many very inexperienced property developers. And in fact, a few that I thought were smarter than me go broke over the time. So let's discuss some of the risks involved if you get into property development. Sure. Some of the, the bigger risks that I've seen come across in, in my time, number one is always it's buying the wrong property, something that's not suited for development, which is the vast majority of, of properties out there. Then there's buying the right property, but at the wrong price. They pay too much, which means that they can't make their margin at the end. Buying at the wrong time of the cycle and not being able to hold on to it is another one that has got people into trouble. Then there's people that have bought a good property, but they haven't done a proper feasibility. And the feasibility is only as good as the assumptions that you're putting in there. So if you've made bad assumptions or you've forgotten costs or you've underestimated costs, you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble. Then you can build the wrong product. If you're not building something that's 
right for that market, for that demographic, it's not going to be as valuable as it could have been. It's probably not the highest and best use of that site. Got to do your market research. Got to know what your market wants. Then there's other stuff that's probably a little bit outside of our control, like a downturn in the property market, which will lead to lower end values than what you may have been anticipating or potentially higher holding costs. Like interest rates could go up um, in the two, two and a half years while you're doing your development, which is higher expenses and then lower profits for you at the end. Increasing construction costs. Construction costs is the biggest cost outside of the land in your development. So even if that goes up by 5%, 10%, that's a big increase in the overall cost of your development. Changes in supply and demand is also a real risk. Um, we're currently seeing this in inner city apartment market. This, of course, depresses property values and reduces your profit margin as well. Then there's things like unexpected disputes with buildings or trade contractors or unions, which can cause delays to a project. Changes in laws, changes in policies that can affect what you can do with the land, what kind of development you can do. If your development suddenly goes from three units to two, just because a change in town planning policy it can have a massive impact on what you can do and what kind of profits you'll have at the end of your development. Then you've got unexpected delays or increase in holding costs. Probably most likely when you're going through the development approval stage. That's when you're dealing with councils, you're dealing with neighbours, any other stakeholders that might want to have their say in your development. That's the people. That's the riskier bit because it's involved with people. The rest is just process. And it's much easier to predict the timeframes and the costs in that. When it comes to people anything can happen and it's really a bit more unreliable, up in the air and, and riskier for developers. Then you see some inexperienced developers find that some of the improvements they've made in their properties and their developments just don't result in an increase in value. They're not getting their bang for buck in what they're spending and they're spending it in the wrong areas and probably not spending enough in, in the right areas as well. So clearly some of the Risks are in the hands of the developer because they haven't done their homework right or uh, prepared themselves correctly, and others are outside. That's why I guess having a good project manager helps a team that's done it over many, many years and cycles. That's what the team at Metropole helps. And clearly it's one of the areas that we spend a lot of time discussing at the annual property renovations and development workshop that we're holding in October. So go to realestateworkshop.com.au, realestateworkshop.com.au, and find out all about this. Because if you're serious about becoming a property developer, these are the things you need to know. If you just want to start in renovations, many of the same things apply. So let's be honest, we've encountered these things ourselves. Um, and over the years, we've found... Uh, I think the biggest issues are, as you said, Bryce, people have bought the wrong properties, they haven't done a proper feasibility. I've also found people become overconfident, Bryce. They've done something once and they think they've worked. And one of the worst things that can happen to a beginning developer or renovator is get it right the first time. You think you're smarter than you are when it's often um, the market that, that's carried you uh, uh, up. And at this more mature stage of the property cycle, I don't think we can uh, count on the market doing the heavy lifting, as you said, so we've got to get it right. But it's still a good opportunity to get involved in development because this is the stage where a lot of the buy and sell developers are pulling out of the market because they can't make a margin, but those who want to buy, renovate and hold, buy, develop and hold, there's still good margins there. So I guess one of the aims of this podcast was to allow the listeners who want to get involved in property development start to go in with their eyes wide open. See, I've seen seminars and uh, books talk about you can actually uh, buy a development site, build for, sell three, keep one, um, or you can get into property development with mo no money down, or you can get options and, and, and get development approvals and on sell that. It doesn't work that way. I also get emails about the Easter Bunny and Father Christmas it's, there are huge risks involved in property development, but if you get it right and you have the right team around you, then 
that's going to make it more likely for you to be successful, but it's not guarantees. You actually have to know the right questions to ask. Um, you've got to have an architect that doesn't just do things prettily, but actually uh, does things practically. You've got to educate yourself with people who've actually survived in the real world and people who are currently doing it. Um, so, in fact, I know one of the things that you've discussed over the years with your clients, Bryce, is not to allow your architects to be project managers or actually not just allow your builders to build. You actually need a project manager to run this project because most of these things have never been built before. Yeah, absolutely. Architects are really good at what they do, which is coming up with clever designs, clever way of building things and adding value through design. What they're perhaps not good at is the, the role of the developer, which is to make sure that the development is profitable, that it's a good bang for buck, it's not just looking really pretty, that it's doable, that you're actually going to get it past council and you're going to be actually able to build this. And number three, and probably the most important, is that you're actually going to get approval for it. Just because the architect's designed it doesn't mean council's going to approve it. So it's got to be realistic. I think one of the areas we've run out of time to discuss, Bryce, is finance, because that's the biggest stumbling block for not just property renovators and developers, but develop, uh, investors in general. If you've been listening to my podcast, you'll know my feeling is that property investment is a game of finance with some real estate thrown in the middle, even more so with development, because finance for developments varies upon whether you're doing two or three units or bigger projects. It can be called residential commercial lending, even though it's not commercial building, the banks look at developers differently depending upon their experience and depending upon the size of the project. So that's one of the big, big topics we discuss at Daniel Real Estate Development Workshop, realestateworkshop.com.au. Boy, there's so much more to discuss. But as I said, Bryce, we're just giving people a taste. We've gone into quite some detail in some areas. And if you want to find out more, Please join Bryce, myself, Ken Race from Metropole Wealth Advisory. He's going to talk about the right structures for development and joint ventures to finance strategies to specifically specialise in developments and are developing properties for themselves um, and uh, a renovator and some good property strategists at realestateworkshop.com.au. Bryce, thank you very much. This podcast has gone on a little bit longer than we expected, uh, but I think we covered lots of great stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me. Fantastic. So, back to my weekly Michael Yardley podcast every Tuesday, but thanks for taking the time to listen to this special podcast.